Hi there, I'm Jess Necky, Product Development Officer for Learn to Swim here at Swim England. And on today's webcast, I'm joined by Swim England Tutor Training Manager, Fiona McNamee, who is going to talk to me about inclusion in the Learn to Swim programme and beyond. Um, hi, Fiona. Hi. Um, for the sake of the listeners today, um, could you start by sharing a little bit about your background and most importantly, what experience you have in delivering training on inclusive swimming? Yeah, sure. So my background is um, mainly primary school teaching. Teaching. I was a primary school teacher for 12 years. Um, I was also a swimming teacher from the age of 16. So my background is, is that balance of education and swimming teaching. Um, as part of the update of the Level 2 Teaching Swimming Qualification, we developed a workshop um, which supports the new objective, which is to plan for um, participants with SEND. Um, so it's great that the qualifications become more inclusive. This workshop is like a shortened version of that workshop that's now delivered on the Level 2 qualification. So the aim of this session is to have an increased understanding of how to integrate and include learners with special educational needs and or disabilities into your Learn to Swim lessons. And just to note that this workshop is mainly uh, concentrating on mainstream swimming lessons. So we thought it would be important to um, discuss terminology right from the beginning. It's something which um, can scare quite a lot of people and lower their confidence because people don't know what words to use and um, terminology can be quite frightening. So um, just to remind you that you're not meant to be a medical expert in all different types of conditions. You are the swimming teaching expert. Therefore, it's the characteristics that every individual displays which is important. And we're not necessarily looking for the disability. We're looking at their ability in water and working with who we've got in front of us. Um, so that's really important that we find out as much as we can about our individual in front of us from perhaps uh, parents, carers and the swimmer themselves. Okay, I suppose um, a teacher gripe might be that, you know, they aren't paid for the additional time that it might take um, to get to know this learner um, or to adapt the lesson programme or speak to the parents before or after, you know, and they have a very short window in which to deliver a session to lots of children. Um, you know, what would you say to those teachers who might ask, well, why should I take the extra time? Yeah, and again, it's a point that comes up quite often. Um, I would hope, first of all, that, that swimming teachers are in the job because they're people people and they care about the people that they, they've got in their care week in, week out. Um, but I'd also argue that actually, um, if you've got a lesson every week, 30 minutes long, which you don't know what that participant's need is, perhaps they're displaying behaviours that are really challenging and it's become a bit of a negative experience for you, for the participant, more importantly, for the parent. If you add up all those half hours week in, week out, that's a massive amount of time. Mm. So if you kind of balance that with perhaps two, three minutes here and there, opening up channels of communication with the parents, maybe making a phone call after you've been teaching one day, um, maybe a phone call before they start. Actually, the time that all that takes together is going to be a lot less than all those half an hour's week in, week out. So we're going to start by looking at characteristics because as I've said before we're not here to be medical experts we are the swimming teaching experts so I just want you to have a think yourselves of what special educational needs and or disabilities you're already aware of um, and start to think which of these might be visible um, which might be hidden and what characteristics these participants display. Okay have you what do you mean by hidden have you have you got any examples of of what those might be. Yeah, sure. So a visible um, characteristic might be that somebody comes on poolside, perhaps in a wheelchair. Um, mm -hmm. So straight away we can notice that they've got perhaps an additional need. Um, something which is hidden might be that somebody comes onto the poolside and gets in your lesson and it might be halfway through that we're starting to get clues that this person has an additional need through mm -hmm. perhaps their behaviour or perhaps a lack of understanding of what we're saying. Um, so yeah, so it's useful to be aware that, that some needs will be um, visible straight away and some may be hidden and we might we might find out about those later. 
So we could perhaps start to look at these characteristics in different ways. So we might start looking at um, physical disabilities. So somebody um, may display um, perhaps a weakness in their muscles, perhaps hypermobility of their um, joints. It might be that they've got limb loss or they're a wheelchair user or they may have paralysis of part of their body. So these are very much the visible? Yes, a lot of those would be definitely visible needs. Um, we could then look at sensory impairments. So some characteristics they might display are sight loss or limited vision. Uh, it might be hearing loss or limited hearing. It might also display itself as perhaps um, difficulties with balance in the pool or orientating themselves around the pool as well. So I suppose we're kind of moving into the less visible here, aren't we? Because mm -hmm. some of them might present themselves when you st start teaching the core aquatic skills, for example. Yeah, definitely. So then we go to the third characteristic of learning difficult disabilities. Um, and some characteristics here might be repetitive or compulsive behaviours. Um, I had a little boy in my class once who tapped a lot when he was anxious. Mm. Um, it might be motor coordination or organisational challenges. It might not understand our instructions straight away or may take a long time to process what we're saying. Uh, maybe difficulty with eye contact, perhaps Physical aggression could be a characteristic that they're displaying, maybe tantrums or tears sometimes. Mm. Um, some participants may have issues with personal space or have sensory imbalances as well. So these are things that often people might mistake for bad behaviour. a lot, yeah. Um, I also noticed that on this slide you, you mentioned learning disabilities and I know the word disability is often sort of frowned upon these days mm. um, as, you know, potentially like an incorrect term and that kind of leads me on to one of my other queries around sensitive language mm -hmm. and um, you know how how do we go about it how do we know what the right term to use is without offending people um, and do we kind of go to a parent and, or ask a learner if they're old enough directly you know do, do you have ADHD or yeah um, and again it's something which I know people I know swimming teachers want to do their best and mm -hmm. help um, and language is sometimes a massive barrier for them helping mm -hmm. just in case they say the wrong thing um, which is completely understandable so the advice I'd give there is first of all um, hopefully that that need will be identified for you mm. and it will come from the parent perhaps it might be a form that they filled in perhaps they've um, you know phoned your coordinator and they've noted it down or they just talk to you and they use a certain term so therefore whatever term is being used with us is the term that we can start to take and okay. use ourselves we're not there to diagnose anybody mm -hmm. um, so therefore there shouldn't really be any times when we we have a conversation and and put a medical term out there because we're not the medical experts if we were worried about a child and we thought perhaps you know perhaps there's more to this all we'd need to do is just talk through the characteristics that they're displaying mm. for example you know i've noticed that oh let's for example um call her helen um helen today found it really difficult when she was in a team game and i've noticed that a few weeks running is there anything i could do to help so actually we're not we're not labeling that child because we're not an expert to do that but we're just chatting through some characteristics yeah. So it's kind of worry less, communicate more. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing, just to kind of a top tip there, is that um, obviously people don't want to be labelled because say somebody has autis autism or ADHD, that's not the only thing about that person. Mm. So that's why we kind of move away from calling somebody an autistic person and perhaps use, you know, if that's the term that's, that's being given to us, then it's somebody with autism or somebody with ADHD. It's a small aspect of yeah, them. Yeah, small themselves. aspect of yeah. them. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I thought it'd be in, um, important just to spend a, a little moment um, thinking about the swimming experience and the environment of a pool because with somebody with a sensory imbalance which is sometimes people with autism um, a pool site can be really overwhelming for them and it's really important that we have that empathy to understand how they're feeling so Jess I'm just gonna throw it out there to you and listen as you can think as well for yourselves what kind of sights sounds smells textures tastes do we get a poolside that perhaps we don't get in a normal, everyday, you know, house, perhaps? It's 
suppose that's the thing. I don't, I don't really think about it, but actually there's so many prominent and different sights, sounds, smells, I think, is a big one mm. because of the chlorine. Textures, I guess, swimming costumes, it's weird and floats. I mean, what even is that material? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's funny, especially, yeah, especially for someone who's never had that experience before. The sounds, I guess... There's quite a lot of white noise, isn't mm. there, at swimming pools? They might it might be in a large leisure centre, and they'll have other classes and music in the background, um, and then there's the splashing of the water or whistles, I guess, as well. Um, lots of other people shouting, um, which I suppose for for someone with autism it might be really heightened mm. that those noises. Um, sights, oh yeah, swimming goggles. I suppose is a big one, isn't it? It's mm. it's an odd look. Yeah. <laughs> You've never seen it before and no one's ever explained it to you before. Um, taste, I guess, I guess, again, it's the chlorine, isn't it? Uh, from that perspective. Yeah, so a, a swimming pool, stepping onto a swimming pool is a massive challenge for some people. Um, as you know, it looks completely like nothing you've ever seen before. And there's that awareness that actually it can be dangerous. You know, water, we've, we're told from an early age that it can be dangerous. So actually, these participants are going to look to us as swimming teachers mm. to be there for them, for their safety. So that's why it's really important that we empathise with that and we do whatever we can to prepare people with a sensory imbalance um, perhaps on the autistic spectrum um, it might you know be sending a photo or meeting this participant so that they recognize that safe person on poolside it might be showing them pictures um, or pointing them in the right direction of um, any social stories we might know or, or googling swimming pools just so mm. that they've got some sort of almost practice run um, and it's not so overwhelming when they come to the poolside a really nice video just to mention um, just to kind of really empathise with that is the National Autistic Society have got a video called Can You Make It To The End so if this is something that you're really interested in you okay. have a look at so that. that's what Google National Autistic Society Can, Can you, you Make, make it, it To The, the end. end yeah brilliant video so obviously we've we've started looking at different characteristics of swimmers we might get in our lessons. Um, so what can we do to help them? So this is where we start looking at adapting our lessons. And adapting is something that we're going to be doing all the time as good swimming teachers. So um, you might be aware of a model called the STEP model, um, which is used um, throughout general sport. Um, this is a Swim England um, kind of bit more specific um, model that we've, we've put together. But it is, you know, STEP models, things like that are really useful if that's your experience. Um, so I'm going to talk through each one of these um, one at a time. So when we're preparing our lesson, it might be that we adapt the outcome. So all participants perhaps might be doing the same task in our lesson, but a variety of results is expected and, and definitely acceptable. So this is where we start to think of um, our SMART outcomes and objectives. So it might be that the specifics of what that, that skill looks like might be different. Or it might be the measure, so the amount of time or the distance might be different there. Mm. Um, won't won't children sort of? It sounds like there, there's you know there's an adaptation and there's kind of there is going to be a, a focus on that child um, in the activity. You know, you might say to one 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 child, you know, Bob, you can swim fifty meters, but Billy, you, oh, you you'll be fine swimming five, or you could swim without flotation equipment, but you need flotation equipment. Um, do you think those children might feel particularly if they've you know got um, social difficulties and things like that and they feel awkward around other people um whether they might feel like they're the black sheep um and that focus is too much on them if, a, if an activity has been adapted and and they're not as good as everyone else in inverted commas yeah as i say most of these strategies are just good teaching to be honest mm. and um adapting outcomes is something which which as a swimming teacher you'll be doing every lesson mm. and actually it won't be well it shouldn't be that every lesson your your perhaps particular person that you're adapting for um has something different because it won't be every stroke it won't be every skill it won't be every depth it will be certain things and actually you'll be adapting um, which progression which activity 
each of your children are doing anyway. Mm. So it shouldn't be that everybody's doing one thing and your swimmer with SEND is doing something different. You might have two swimmers who have excelled, so you've pushed them onto the fourth progression in your lesson. You might have, you know, the main cohort, which are perhaps on progression three, um, and perhaps one or two of your swimmers on progression two. So adapting outcomes is something that we we should be quite used to and we should be using quite a lot. Um, So we're adapting for different people different lessons so it shouldn't be that one person stands out every lesson okay um another thing that we might adapt is the task um so perhaps there's there's different tasks or different versions of the same task so for example um it might be that if somebody's got a physical disability then it might be perhaps um an an arm pull activity and um perhaps actually if if they've got um you know uh, muscle weakness or even an amputee then obviously you're going to adapt that task and it might be that perhaps there's a bit of sculling going on for them perhaps more kicking involved so or it might be um, team games versus individual if you've got somebody who really struggles in a team game then you may give them the same game but perhaps they do they do it on their own or with a with a buddy so yeah different outcomes different tasks okay and I suppose actually that's um, a great way of um, making sure participants don't feel like they're standing out is to maybe split split the lesson into teams or groups um, and just say you know team a you do this this one this time and team b you do that that time and you switch the groups around and just ensure that that participant who requires the adaptation is kept in groups that are doing an activity that they can actually manage yeah and I've actually seen it um, kind of working the opposite way where a little boy um, who had ADHD the, the, the teacher kept the whole class doing exactly the same task, going to exactly the same outcome, and it was too hard for him. And he got, you know, going from progression one to progression two to progression mm. three, it was too much for him. And he got so wound up that he was physically um, like boring his fingernails into oh. his hands because he was so yeah. frustrated that he couldn't do it. Whereas actually if we'd kept him on, you know, perhaps progression two, gave him lots of positive yeah, feedback, when he was excelling, moved him yeah. on when he was, you know, achieving, he would never have got mm. to feel like that. So yeah, so there's, there's swings and roundabouts with how they can feel. So another way we might adapt our lesson is with the resource that we use. So it might be that they've got the same task, but actually they've got different equipment or resources in order to achieve it. So the obvious one here is the um, pool equipment, teaching equipment. For example, noodles, floats, with or without equipment is the obvious one, which again is something which swimming teachers will be doing every lesson with every participant. Um, But some really nice examples that I've seen um, are things like um, stimulus. So um, I remember seeing, it was a swimming assistant actually, had a little boy with autism and she was trying to get him to lie on his back and kick on his back and she said, okay, head back, look up at the stars. And he said quite rightly to her, there are no stars above my head because they weren't so um next lesson what i saw her do she'd um been at home and she cut out some silver stars so when she did um, the lesson with him again she held the stars above his Uh. head so it was that visual which i thought was beautiful um i've also um seen people use video so obviously if somebody um perhaps has hearing difficulties then obviously they're really going to rely on that visual Mm. so pictures videos of what perhaps the skill should look like is really really useful um also maybe somebody with autism who um wants that familiarity perhaps could bring something from home that sits on the side and watches them um so yeah so it's one of those the sky's the limit of resources really Mm. and it's the more we know about that participant and we know what they like um we can start theming the equipment so for example um i had a little boy who was obsessed with thomas the tank engine and spoke that's how he kind of learned about the world was through Thomas the Tank Engine um, and so when he spoke he spoke in all the um, uh, different train voices oh. so actually theming something as Thomas the Tank Engine and having that noodle as he is in it would just work for him whereas telling him it was a noodle and off you go kick meant nothing yeah so actually the more we get to know them actually the easier it becomes to teach teach 
Um, and just me- to mention there as well about different awards as well. Mm. So don't forget that as well as the Stage 1 to 7 awards, we've got the Distance Awards, um, Water Skills Awards, the Alpha Step Awards, ICAM Awards. There's so many Learn to Swim Awards that it's definitely worth, if you've got a child and you want to keep them motivated and perhaps they are just taking a little bit longer to achieve the outcomes in the stage. That does not mean that they don't go away with something. So yeah. definitely get on the Learn to Swim website um, and have a look at all those different awards. There's loads. Yeah, that's right. And I think the point of those awards is that they're specifically designed to award reward smaller steps. Mm-hmm. Um, so they tend to, particularly like the ICANN awards, they reward single aquatics achievement of single aquatic skills such as I can float, I can roll onto my back, I can roll onto my front. And a great one is I can gr- I can blow bubbles, mm. um, you know, and it is, as you say, like a really great motivator for those, for those learners who are moving through the course stages, just that little bit more slowly. Mm. Um, because, you know, I think the Learn to Swim team at Swim England really understands that um, everybody moves at a different pace um, and people reach their milestones um, at, at different times and again that's every swimmer that's mm. not just swimmers with SEMD that is every swimmer true. Yeah. so again a lot of this is just good teaching strategies absolutely so the next way that we could adapt our lesson is through the support that we give so it could be different types of support or the amount of support we give a swimmer so obviously we're thinking straight away about how we use our assistant not forgetting that as the level two it is our role to direct and supervise the assistant so we have to give them specific instructions um, it might be using equipment to support, so it might be, you know, floating, um, especially if you've got somebody with perhaps a physical disability and therefore there, there is an imbalance in the body, then um, equipment can physically support them. Um, or it might be kind of that motivational support. So um, I've seen buddy systems used really, really well with perhaps children with learning difficulties and therefore an instruction's given and they don't quite understand it and unless it's repeated and they've seen it happen. So actually a buddy who can, you know, perhaps repeat the instruction and show them how to do it. It's lovely for the buddy because they're feeling really responsible. And then actually you can congratulate, oh, wow, you listen so well to your buddy. And that skill was amazing. So actually Mm. you can reward them both in that partnership. It also works really well for adults as well because a lot of adults, um, you know, perhaps with learning difficulties, they're getting a social aspect out of that and buddying up adults. Again, it's just a good teaching strategy, um, but helps them with their learning, but also helps them make friends too yeah um so just a little note on manual support there because i know a lot of people will be thinking about well how do i physically or how does an assistant physically support them in the water um obviously we would need to um if there's anything different than the supporting head hands equipment shoulders if there was anything different to that then we would definitely, again, need to be communicating with the swimmer, with their parent or carer, mm-hmm. um, you know, are they okay if I touch the back of their head? Because actually some people really aren't, it's too personal, it covers their ears. Um, so yeah, so before we're going to manually support that child, it's really important we have a conversation. It's important that we are talking the swimmer through exactly what we're going to do. Um, and it may be that perhaps we need a risk assessment in there as well. So risk assessments may be needed for things like different entries, different exits, um, perhaps in deep water, or it could be perhaps a personal need. So, for example, if there's a neck instability um, or, as I say before, an area of the body that they're not comfortable with being touched, then it's just kind of making sure that everybody's on the same page um, and we are looking at perhaps risk assessing anything that perhaps needs to be done slightly differently. Mm -hmm. And do some centres also have their own risk assessments put in place? Are these the sort of risk assessments that would be done separately to that? Do they kind of... Are they quite different? Yeah, again, it will be completely dependent on that individual. Mm. If they need something that is not covered in a in a pool risk assessment or not um, usual practice so it could be actually they might need a little bit 
again, we don't we don't want to be lifting loads and things no. like that. We want to find a way for all swimmers to help themselves where possible. However, again, if it comes to something like um, emergency handling and perhaps we're in deep water and we want to be able to know that actually if they get into difficulty that I can do this to help yeah. them. So it's anything that perhaps doesn't fit the normal picture of manual support. Obviously, going along with safeguarding guidelines, that's without saying. But anything that might be slightly different, then it's always worth doing a risk assessment, sharing that with the swimmers, um, adults, um, and just agreeing things like that. Okay, so that's sort of a time where a teacher really needs to be quite proactive and knowing the difference between the pool's regular risk assessment mm. and things based on that individual learner and mm. what their parent or their carer um, has told them. Yeah, again, communication again is key. Yeah. So the final way that we might adapt our lesson is the type of communication we use. So obviously there's different types of communication, for example, verbal and non-verbal. Um, so obvious ones there, if somebody um, has a sight difficulty, then we're going to rely perhaps more on verbal language, making sure that perhaps if somebody's got a learning difficulty, that our instructions are really simple. Um, again, maybe some sort of picture clue may help them understand. Um, if somebody um, has a hearing impairment, then again, perhaps they might need more non-verbal signs, symbols, gestures. Um, and on the screen there, I've just got um, a bit of um, an idea of what's used in schools quite a lot. And these aren't necessarily swimming specific, but that kind of how to operate in a class situation. So, you know, when to be quiet, when to stop, um, what's happening first and then next. Um, when they need help, when it's kind of taking turns in a game. Mm -hmm. So it might be that we have kind of little cards for how to operate in a swimming lesson when it's your turn to do things as well. So just to kind of round up there, just kind of as anything that doesn't fit in those different ways is obviously sticking to routines, especially, I mean, for children generally, children really like routine but especially for any learners that you know struggle with any changes to routines that they are prepared for that um using first names to prompt listening again it's just good teaching teachers will be doing that all the time rewarding small achievements again any swimmer who perhaps needs that boost of self-confidence that's going to help um yeah, motivating learners for what they like. There's nothing that says when you've got noodles for 12 children that they've all got to have a boat. You know, actually, that child could have Thomas the Tank Engine and that child over there maybe on their unicorn. Of it, course. Yeah. yeah, there's no reason we can't do that. And the more we know about that swimmer, the more we'll be able to help that. Um, keep verbal language simple. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Repetition's a good thing. And also kind of using that questioning. We give an instruction. Can you tell me what we're doing? Check that understanding. Um, keep voice clear, calm and friendly. Um, I'll tell you about one situation I saw where a little boy who had autism and did struggle in lessons um, was coming in on a... Um, they were doing a swimming teaching course, so it was a crash course every day. Um, and to be honest, the, the training swimming teachers were really quite nervous because, you know, they're new. Um, but I did hear one swimming teacher say, and I'm going to call him Bob just for, that wasn't his name, but we'll call him Bob for an example. Um, oh, no, I've got Bob today. So my heart dropped because I thought, well, that's not the attitude that obviously mm. we want. But obviously that he's expressing how he's feeling. He's, you know, new to teaching. Um but the, the saddest thing was, when Bob came onto poolside, rather than turn round, welcome Bob onto poolside with a smile, open body language, calm and friendly voice, mm -hmm. he looked around, he saw him from the edge of the pool, and he went, oh God, he's here. Mm -hmm. Now, without even mentioning Bob's name, Bob knew straight away that he meant him because he was looking at him. He saw his, the teacher's body language went closed, his facial expression was not calm and friendly, and straight away from the other side of the pool, Bob got really upset, started screaming, uh, didn't want to get in the pool. And actually, that wasn't Bob's fault. No. Um, so something as simple as being welcoming, thinking about making sure our communication is really welcoming, is so powerful, like really powerful. 
and makes it a positive um, lesson for everybody involved, including you, the swimming teacher. Of course, it's just about self awareness, really, isn't yes, it? Yes, and being definitely. a little bit more conscientious. Mm, definitely, and thinking actually, we may find that lesson challenging because we're trying out new things and we're trying to help. But actually, for that swimmer, it's ten times more challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, and the final one, which is kind of the, the golden thread running through, is gathering as much information as we can, um, sharing good moments, you know, they did this today, because that is making sure that that communication stays open between you and the parent, you and the swimmer as well, um, so that actually if you do have to have difficult conversations... Well, you've got a balance then, haven't you? It's not always going over, well, they struggled with this and the behaviour wasn't acceptable. Actually, the more kind of one, two-minute conversations we can have, positive and challenging, you know, conversations, the better. Yeah, and I suppose that's also where the Learn to Swim, particularly the complimentary awards, come into play, isn't it? Um, Because that way that the child can also show their parents what they've been achieving and it's a great way for parents and teachers to share what level the child is at and how they're performing. Yeah, definitely. Um, So just to finish off, just to kind of apply what we've been talking about now, we're going to just discuss a few learners. Now, these are completely made up, but they are based on actual um, swimmers that swimming teachers have had. So the first one's Daffid, and he's a reluctant swimmer. He doesn't like class-based situations, as he often doesn't pick things up as quickly as others, and regularly copies what other people are doing, as he hasn't understood what the teacher has told him to do. He often gets told off for not listening and he dreads being asked to go first. When the teacher is speaking to him, he can look like he's staring into space for a little while after he has given instructions. He is quite proud of the fact that he can swim very good breaststroke and his teacher compliments him on this and uses him to demonstrate how to do it. He likes this stroke because it's a bit slower and he can keep his head out of the water. So somebody like Daffid, perhaps there's a hidden need there. Mm. Um, and actually, as we're getting to know Daffid, we're finding that he you know, doesn't pick things up quickly. If he were, he's asked to go first, he doesn't do the right thing. So we're looking here at perhaps we need to make sure that we are um, checking that he's understood things, repeating instructions, keeping them really simple, breaking things down. And not asking him to go first. If he is happy to not go first and watch other people, then that he's kind of showing us what he needs. Which, to be honest, a lot of children will do. Um, they'll be telling us what they need, and sometimes it's up to us to listen and really notice that. Um, so, yeah, so I think definitely reinforcing how good he is at this breaststroke um, is a really nice thing to keep him motivated and keep his self-confidence up. So again, for Daffid, there's nothing really special or, you know, no amazing new strategy there. It's just good teaching and just noticing what he needs. So our next profile is um, Charlotte. So most weeks, Charlotte comes onto the poolside in a wheelchair. Every now and then she comes to the poolside using crutches. Um, She appears really determined to get in the pool. I like this about Charlotte. And she has a big smile on her face most of the time that she's in the pool. She uses the pool hoist to get in and out, but gets really frustrated when it takes time for the lifeguards to work the hoist. Perhaps sometimes she has to miss part of the lessons. She floats really well in the pool, but struggles to swim front crawl with her face in the water for some distance. She's happier on her back, but doesn't get much propulsion from her legs. So... For me, looking at Charlotte, we've got to try and motivate her with the, you know, this this entry. Maybe could she speak to the family again, communication? Could she come a few minutes earlier so that that, that kind of transition into the pool can be done on time? Um, and we're not kind of waiting for the lifeguards. Um, again, the fact that she wants to be there and she loves it is going to make, you know, you, we all want a Charlotte in our lesson if she's got that brilliant positive attitude. Looking at what she can do in the pool, she can float really well. So therefore, we're going to really make a fuss of the floating that she's doing. That means she's going to have a great body position. So we're really going to work with her on her propulsion. So again, when I was talking about outcomes before and how we might adapt the outcome, it might be that she is you know, a bit steadier on working up and achieving those outcomes. But if we've got four or five progressions in our lesson, she's going to be achieving something which will keep her learning, keep her progressing, um, but working at her pace. Um, 
So next we're going on to Connor. Um, Connor's well liked by the other children but gets in trouble a lot in a class situation as he's often seen not following instructions. He is boisterous in swimming lessons and loves splashing and feeling how the water moves around him. His parents are very defensive of him as they see that he struggles to go at the slow pace of the lesson. He complains that his swimming teacher talks too much and he gets bored listening and wants to practice his technique more. So the thing about Connor is, again, although he's probably doing it in perhaps a, not how we'd want him to, mm-hmm. he's telling you exactly what he needs. He needs a faster pace to the lesson. Again, children, if we talk too much on the pool side, every you know child of a certain age is going to get bored and they're going to miss half of what we said. So actually, it's just good teaching to keep the pace going, to keep our communication succinct Um and so there are there are certain things there that are just good teaching. It could be that if we want to adapt something for him, that perhaps if he wants to, you know, practice his technique more, then perhaps he can go halfway back, halfway back. So for him, he feels like perhaps he's doing a bit more, even though perhaps he, he's not. Or perhaps if we've got other people in our lesson who are taking longer to get back and he's hanging around, why can't he go again? Mm-hmm. Um, as I say, even if it's just a halfway and back. So again, there's lots of things there for Connor um, and not necessarily things that that are special or, um, you know, completely newfound ideas. They're just good teaching. Um, and another good one for Connor is getting him to repeat instructions back to you, yeah. maybe giving him a job whilst he's waiting, making, you know, giving him some sort of important role. But also with Connor, if he gets in trouble a lot, we need to really notice the good things that he does, reward that positive behaviour, um, even if it's for something small, um, just so that he's learning um, how to behave um, properly in a lesson as well. Yeah, and I think that, that really reiterates, doesn't it, that lessons aren't textbook, they're not, they're, they're meant to be dynamic and fluid, and there's going to be a certain amount of ad-libbing, um, and yeah, changing the shape of the lesson to reward or motivate certain learners, um, and I've also noticed just... Um, for the sake of the listeners that all of these ages they're all kind of six and young ages um but this is all applicable to adults in exactly the same way um those adults might be able you might be able to communicate more with those adults directly or they may also have a carer Mm. um or or a parent as well um who may be looking after them um and it all it all counts the same and what's funny about adult lessons is um we tend to adapt more for adult lessons because mm-hmm. they have different reasons for coming and different motivations and we do that naturally for adults yet when we've got 12 children in a class it, sometimes we feel like they've got to all be do, seen to do the true. same thing at yeah. the same time and it's not true so final profile is ben Ben has previously had swimming lessons up to the age of five. However, he was involved in a road traffic accident at the age of six, which resulted in hearing loss. He is quite confident in the pool, always enjoying family swimming sessions. His parents have encouraged him to have more formal lessons, which he's keen to do, but he's a little nervous about this, as it means he will need to remove his hearing aids. So the fact that, again, Ben likes swimming, Mm. we want him in our lesson, don't we? Because we've got that really positive attitude, which is a great start. Um, I think two things in here um, which call out to me straight away is that he's a bit nervous about lessons. Perhaps he hasn't been in a lesson situation before. And he's going to have to remove hearing aids. So Mm. it's that fear of the unknown again. It's that, what do I do when I get there? What's it going to be like? So the more we can do for Ben to prepare him, let him know what will happen, what, you know, where are we going to store these hearing aids? Again, communicating with his adults, what's the best thing to do? Um, again with Ben if, if, if he's got hearing loss he's going to rely on our non-verbal communication so perhaps we could buddy him up with someone who could perhaps get his attention if I need his attention because they'll be in the pool um, and keeping my demonstrations really really accurate for him maybe using video clips as well might work with Ben Okay, so just to kind of summarise and finish off now is kind of looking at that question of why is inclusion so important? Like, why should we make these efforts um, for these swimmers? Um, And I think when we think about swimming... 
there really aren't many special educational needs or disabilities that cannot access the swimming pool. And actually, swimming has massive benefits for all people, all ages, um, from fitness, mobility, helping improve in balance. It's got that social aspect as well, build self-confidence. So actually, just a 30-minute lesson with somebody once a week can really, really change somebody's life. Um, and that's before we even talk about um, Paralympians, uh, you know, the Ellie Simmons of, of the world, mm. that actually we might just have the next Paralympic athlete in our lesson. How do we know we haven't? So actually what they're asking for is somebody to believe in them and to do what they can to help and to really look at their ability. Because as I say, it could go either way and actually we could make a really positive change in their life. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Fiona. Um, And for our listeners, if you'd like any more support on any of the topics covered in today's session, um, please do email in at learntoswim at swimming.org. That's learntoswim at swimming.org. And a member of the Learn to Swim team will be able to point you in the right direction. Or do explore our Inclusion Hub, uh, where you'll hopefully be viewing this webcast. Um, Here you'll find lots more supporting resources for swimming teachers, assistants and coordinators, um, and also learners and parents and carers um, who are either delivering or need help delivering inclusive swimming lessons or indeed are participating in those inclusive swimming lessons. Um, Some examples of things that are on the hub include downloadable guides, helpful links, case studies, consultation forms and much, much more. Um, So if you're not viewing this webcast on the Swim England website, then just head over to swimming.org forward slash inclusion. That's swimming.org forward slash inclusion to get access to all of these great resources.